Okay. Yeah, the multidisciplinary function. So the context is cosmology, large scale structures of cosmology. So the late universe, the, let's say, the final goal is to prove the fundamental constituent of the universe using statistical galaxies. And so the multiplicity function, <coughs> we want to study many statistics to study the cosmology. And the multi multiplicity function tells us the statistics of halos and voids. More specifically, uh, uh, the multiplicity function, usually called f of r, such as a function of the scale or uh, of a mass or whatever you want, for example, for sigma, the standard deviation of linear fluctuation, is the fraction of fluctuation in the universe that will collapse at some epoch to form a dark matter halo, so a, a collapsed region of matter in the universe, or to form a void. A void in a case structure, not backwards, something like that, is just an under-density region well defined in some way that I go back later. And so, so you can explain why sigma, m, and r are sure, sure equivalent. Sure. So uh, if we consider, um, uh, okay, let's start consider uh, early universe so the, where all fluctuation in the matter are small. Uh, we can describe the matter distribution um, with linear theory, and according to that, we um, we have that. Um, we consider, since all the fluctuations are small, we can consider that uh, if we consider the mass contained in a square with the radius r, it would have a well defined mass. And um, also, sigma is defined as the square root of the alpha radius and function of this quantity filter on a given scale r. It's about a component of monotonic function, so we can also create perform a one to one map between this standard deviation of the equation with the radius to the radius inclusive a given amount of mass. Okay, so uh, this uh, this quantity is, is pretty important in, in cosmology. We use this quantity to describe for example the voice function, is, uh, the voice function, the distribution distribution of Void is a under density region as a function of their size. Usually, we prefer to write this quantity as a function of sigma because it's a really, very computationally easier in this way. And this is pretty interesting for cosmology because I, I spend a lot of time spending a lot of time on this quantity. In some way, complementary <coughs> with respect to standard cosmological probes such as the Tupolin conversion function and so on. And also with voids, you can see different functions with respect to, you can see with over densities. And also the enormous function that is uh, pretty important in cosmology that actually can be written in the formally the same way. To do a cluster count analysis, you need an enormous function. If you want to model your galaxy distribution with any HOD or different prescription, you yeah. need an enormous function. So, uh, this, uh, the, uh, what is the numerator? Yeah, uh, sorry, it is the radius of the voids, this is the, the mass of your dark matter halo, because usually we measure voids, uh, the volume of voids, so you know, the radius of the void, the void and <coughs> we measure the mass of the halo, halo mass. But that, so, the, the thing that is a function of m is a little n? Sorry, this is a little n. That's a little n? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, yeah, it is. so it's like a number density. A number density. This his is a his number McDonald's density. m is McDonald's a is a small n. <laughs> yeah, I tried to do it more around, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. The McDonald's but, is but a the, number density. This, this thing is in units of per unit volume per unit mass. Per unit, yeah. This is a number okay. density and this is a mass. So okay, it's a, got it. Yeah. Differential, differential quantity with respect to the mass and over the volume. Okay. So, this is pretty important for this. You can also compute, if you want to compute uh, the bias parameters, use this function. And also, if you are interested in primordial black holes, uh, the, form, the, the formal.
formalism. So, what is wrong? Yeah, and I didn't say it. Rho is the mean density of the universe. So, if you if you wait the mean density, the number, the mean density, the matter, the matter density of the universe. So, the mean density over the mass is one over the volume. So, it's okay. So, in cosmology, there is kind of computation. You usually divide the spaces in in the Lagrangian space. And Eulerian space, where Lagrangian and Eulerian doesn't any any to do with Lagrangian and Eulerian coordinates, so it's a bit confusing. But we use this kind of definition. So the Lagr uh, Lagrangian space in cosmology is the initial density field linearly evolved up to the epoch of interest. Where initial means, uh, in this case, uh, enough high redshift to be fully described by linear theory. And linear level, it means that we just change the amplitude of our field by multiplying it uh, with a linear growth factor. So, in the, by solving the Lyran equation uh, uh, solution of our perturbation, this is a scalar quantity, we multiply our field by this time. Your area field on the other side is the fully nonlinear evolved space. And to perform this kind of computation, we usually determine the, the region that we want to, for which we want to describe the statistic here. For example, this can be a head and low minus M in the Lagrangian space. We study here the statistics and then we map the entire statistics in the Eulerian space. We do this trick because the Lagrangian space is the initial density field uh, up to a constant factor, so it is a Ga Gaussian runoff field. Uh, you can add a small amount of time or the longer density, but it's just a small amount. At the end of the day, you have a uh, Gaussian field, everything is easier to understand. Eulerian space is a uh, very long Gaussian. If you think, you can think this kind of division uh, with simulation, this is like the initial condition of simulation for the amplitude, and this is a full simulation. So everything is much easier if you study uh, in the Lagrangian space where everything is linear. And now we have to find a way to connect our object, our but Lagrangian object, that we when, when things are linear, the Eulerian, the Eulerian space does just sort of go like, the Eulerian space density field does just go linearly. Right? right, and so then there's like almost no difference. But I mean, there is a difference between the Lagrangian space and the Eulerian space in that case, but it doesn't seem to matter. Like what? Like in what case does is Lagrangian simple? And okay. like Eulerian definitely gets complicated when it's nonlinear. But yeah. then the Lagrangian case must also get complicated when it's nonlinear. Yeah, but it's much easier. It's just, it's just easier. It's easier. Yeah. Okay. And so the idea is that we find a way to detect the object of the, let's say, the batches that we call up through common tables in the Lagrangian space. We study the evolution of single batches individually, and we map the statistics from one space to the other. This is the basic idea. And to do that, we have to find a way to, to map this, the, the region in the initial linear space that will collapse to form a halo or that will, or that will expand to form voids. And the way uh, so, so I have a question. So we were saying this dark matter halo cluster, right? So you basically assume this is the reason why the void was formed. Yeah, yeah. But I also read some papers saying like primordial supernova type three supernova explosion might actually form this large scale region. Is that a, a part of your consideration on that? Uh, supernovae? Yeah, like type three supernovae. Yes. Yeah, so you usually, usually you want large scale. Uh, you use this framework to understand the larger scale, so you, you, it's very difficult to, to describe a substructure within the galaxy. So you, just, so you, the, yeah, you, yeah, you want to describe the dark matter halo containing uh, galaxies. Okay. If, you, if you want, a dark matter halo can be a cluster of galaxies. If you want. So you can describe this kind of object. You cannot describe uh, with this galaxies. galaxies. And so we have to find a way to map these kind of quantities. Uh, so the idea is that we can, if we can study an object, uh, we can study the, the, the full nonlinear evolution of the 
results. Like for example, if we study the evolution of an initial over density, a small over density, this is a redshift, uh, that at some point will collapse. So its density will divert. And the linear counterpart, that is the, um, we just use the linear equation to study how these, the same initial over density will evolve. In this way, we can, we can have a map between linear theory and the full nonlinear collapse. And this is the way how we track object in a regular space. So if you use the simple model, a spherical approximation, this is just a toy model where uh, we have that all, all halos will collapse at the same linear density one just threshold. So this is just a, a toy model. You can complete this picture considering um, tidal fields, um, elliptical collapse. And you, if you do, do that, you find that halos would form um, with a scale dependent threshold. It means that more massive halos will have a different form, linear formation threshold with respect to a smaller one, and so on. You can have also an analytical prediction for that, and this is what we do for halos. For boys, it's pretty similar to the difference that there is um, boys uh, do not have something similar to halo collapse. You don't have uh, an have a, a void forming heaven, you have just a, an under density region that will expand forever. And you have to find a way to, let's say, uh, define your population. And what people, what we do is to fix a density counter threshold of the whole voice. That it means uh, we consider voice depth in the nonlinear space, and we take this we found uh, we find the linear threshold corresponding. So this is the idea. And to describe the statistics in the literature, there are two main uh, frameworks. Uh, so, so, how does that threshold compare to like minus one? Minus one? Yeah, okay. The nonlinear <laughs> like, pressures cannot be minus one because uh, this is a physical problem. I see. Delta is row the, the density of your patches, the physical density over the mean density minus one. So if, if you have an empty region, this is only minus one. This is not true for uh, the linear theory because in linear theory, theory you, have, you have as negative a value as you want. The idea is that we have our initial, initial um, under density <coughs> that can be a minus epsilon. And we multiply it by the linear growth factor, that is the linear growth factor and the redshift of interest over in the one. I redshift um, of the initial redshift. So this one, this number can be as large as we want. Yeah. Right, I'm just wondering, you, I, I thought you were saying you're going to set a threshold for yeah. the formation of a void. And I'm just wondering, does that threshold end up being like, Minus a half, or does it end up being like minus ten? No, no it's like what is minus the... a half. Yeah. I see. Okay, got it. Thanks. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, there are two main frameworks to do that. There are the excursion set and the theory. So, for about this point, both did. Um, frameworks. The, the main quantity we want to study is the density contrast field in Lagrangian space or linear space at a given Lagrangian position, filtered on a given on a given scale. So we can uh, write this quantity for space. Um, 
different. And he considered the run, uh, how this field evolved according to changing the smoothing balance. So if we start with infinity in radius, we are waiting our field over the entire universe, and so we start with zero. Uh, zero. And this would be performed a random walk, um, lowering the radius. Now, when there is W here is some is a filter function. Yeah, it's some the window top function. Or yeah, yeah. It can be the top the ocean, whatever we want. Mm -hmm. But then you have to choose properly to just get your problem. It's a big low function. The idea is that you can get the multiplicity function, so the fraction of equation that will form voids or halos, uh, solving the first crossing distribution of your barrier uh, of this quantity. So this is the idea. Is, is uh, pretty simple to get the multiplicity function. The problem is the physical meaning of this multiplicity function. Because if you look at this problem carefully, since we are waiting our field over all the space Q, at the end of the day, we get the, the volume fraction of uh, fluctuation that reaches a given density counter. So that is, and the link from this quantity to the distribution of hello and voice is not so clear. On the other hand, we, we can have a big theory. Usually uh, fixes this quantity. I studied it, the spatial distribution of this field. And now, uh, uh, according to this theory, a Lagrangian halo or void is an extra month for your field. So you have to study the value of your field plus the gradient and the ash. We study all the statistics, and that's great. You can number density, two point, two point, correlation function, whatever you want in this theory. The problem is that it's not really clear how to connect your, uh, for example, your number density of object to your multiplicity function. Because if you, for example, filter your space when you have smoothing scale R, and then you consider a, a, a larger smoothing scale, you may, you may get that multiple, multiple smaller halos are within a larger halo. And this is a problem because if you consider the evolution of the larger halo, it will collapse uh, in a, a unique halo, and so it, it will squeeze out all the other subjects. So the idea of this work to, to have um, a universal multiplicity function is to merge these two quantities, these two framework, and to perform an exclusion set under the subset of extra of maxima for halos and minima for voids. And uh, so these. So can I just ask this? Yeah. A multiplicity function is what? What is a multiple? What do you mean? What do you mean by multiplicity function? And the multiplicity function just can be the fraction of equation that we form a class of object. Okay, so it's just like like so. The, the mass function of halos would be, yeah, you would call yeah. that a multiplicity function of? The mass function okay. is the multiplicity function normalized in a specific way. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's it. And so, according, so we want to perform our exclusion set over the subset of maxima or minima. And these uh, lead us, uh, lead us directly to a more precise definition of Lagrangian halo at point. So we want the Lagrangian, let's start with halo. At the position Q, the Lagrangian position Q, um, we want that our Lagrangian position Q is not contained in, uh, in any larger void, uh, halos. Then we want that this to be a maximum at R, and uh, we want that R is the larger scale at which uh, uh, the field in this position cross the barrier. So we want to, st to study this, the statistic for this kind of object. Sorry, the Q is. Two is that Q is the location of a maximum when this field is smooth 
with with a window function of radius r. This is a morph field. And so this is also a Lagrangian halo or void, but okay. it satisfies these three conditions. So, uh, so cool. Q is not contained in any other halos because otherwise, if an halo collapses, uh, everything that is at a smaller scale will collapse within the larger halo. Uh, we want also to be a maximum at this limit scale because we want uh, to start a maximum. And we also want that R is the larger scale at which uh, this field in this position reaches the formation threshold for halos. We want to study the statistics. Actually, this is pretty pretty difficult, and for better is almost uh, impossible if you want to do it by brute force. So our idea is to was to find an effective way to do computation and focusing on the multiplicity function, but also other statistics such as we, we try with the halo matter transformation function, and it worked pretty well. And so the idea to how to handle with this kind of problem came from the literature. And we had some hints for that. The first one is a shell and more and Dorman and one who this paper they uh, they present the, the moving barrier, so the, the formation barrier for halos uh, when you have an elliptical collapse. An interesting thing, in this case you have a precise theoretical prediction, but when they fit the multiplicity function corresponding to this uh, moving barrier against simulation, they found that them, um, their theoretical prediction predict um, much higher density contract threshold with respect to what they get from simulation. And the other one is uh, Robert Santal. Uh, they did the opposite for the study the opposite problem. They considered halos in simulation. They track the part the particle position of halos back to the initial condition. In this way, they are in the Lagrangian space. If they if you are scaling <coughs> the amplitude in some way, and define the, the opposite. So the formation the linear formation threshold directly measured in simulation is much higher than the prediction of certain shell one and the third work is Paranjape and Shelton. Um, well, where they find an effective way to merge these two theory, theory and uh, exclusion set, but this is probably only on a very large scale, and in the limit where um, they can do that, they recover this mismatch between pressures. So this was the idea. Uh, that we can use the standard excursion set approach uh, to work uh, with an effective barrier, we can in some way recover the multiplicity function. So we want to, to use an effective barrier that does not correspond to the physical one for halos and voice formation, but can contain, uh, can account for the fact that we are waiting not all over the space, but only on, under the subset of uh, of excellence. And mm, the idea is that this moving barrier can contain the, the statistics of this kind of object that you want to study mm, for the multiplicity function and even beyond for correlation function. And so the plan uh, was, uh, was to first find a more general expression for a multiplicity function, it means a multiplicity function for any possible moving barrier. <coughs> and then uh, find the effective barrier describing our statistics and we did that with the numerical step. And at the end, I, I, time for the, the, I also discussed the, I can discuss the map from the Lagrange for your area space, this is an important part of all this work. So the idea to get the multiplicity function, and so at the end of the day, an analogous function or a voices function, is to study our uh, Lagrange, our field in Lagrange space. Drop okay. There is uh, this quantity. Okay, 
the study, the study, the statistics of the Euclid uh, as a random wall. Uh, we consider the Langevin equation that tells us how this field responds to an infinitesimal, infinitesimal increase of the smoothing radius. And to do that, we also have to know so this quantity is equal to a stochastic force, so this is a stochastic differential equation. And we need to know also the the correlation of different steps of this on the work. So we can solve this uh, numerically. This work for any possible barrier, and uh, we, will, we will end also analytically. The problem to analytically solve this problem is that uh, an extra solution exists only in the case where this correlation term goes to zero to a direct delta, and this is the Markovian case. So, you're saying delta is a random walk, or I describe it as a random walk. <coughs> okay, so you, you, you consider your field. So, so, position. Right, so, so the field delta is the random walk. The field delta is that's that's right. And then you describe you study the evolution of this field as a function of radius. So if you sit in a point of the universe, you filter your universe at a decreasing radius. Right. The value of this field will perform a random walk. But I thought that the, for a random walk, there's no first derivative. Like it, it, the, the first derivative is not defined for a uh, it's not defined if you consider the Markovian process. So you have a Markovian random work that is the standard and new jagged random work. And this means that this quantity is a direct delta. But you can solve this equation. You have a stochastic force for that. And uh, you can solve it. So you have other problem if you have more physical filter here. Is this quantity, this integral is very difficult to it's very difficult to make this integral compared. You're you're thinking of the diffusion equation. Right. That the you know d by dt equals something, you know, as a second derivative in space. But in this case, he's not writing down the diffusion, he's not writing down the continuum version. He's just saying delta is a thing that's under a random walk. And, and, yeah, by the and, and and the time is radius uh, is as okay. R here. Yeah, uh, our time is radius. If you consider the Markovian case, so uh, you can have the Fokker quantum equation associated with this equation that tells you how to describe the diffusion problem, and you can solve it them analytically. It was done by Chandrasek. You can do that, and, and you obtain uh, the. You can solve the problem in this case, and you play them. Uh, some of the multiplicity function use uh, the first uh, process check. There is, at the end of the day, is uh, uh, is um, a Markovian random walk with a different normalization. You can do that. The problem is that if you use a uh, this is the only problem that you can solve analytically. All the other cases you cannot. And so you have to find a way to account properly for this correlation. And um, so the idea for comfort is that it studied the first crossing distribution of this uh, random work equation. If we start, uh, uh, first of all, our, we change coordinate. And we, instead of the radius, we consider S is sigma squared. <coughs> Using this as a variable, it is much easier. And uh, if we consider our random work, that we cross the barrier, this is the barrier. Uh, this is the barrier. So our random work, that we cross the barrier. So this is the problem that we want, that we want to solve. So instead of directly solve this problem to control correlation, we we stop any, any 
infinitesimal delta t before our processing. We study them, let's say, um, with Taylor expand studying the velocity of this field, and uh, we at the end of the day, okay, we found an approximated way to do that. That is a very, very long expression <coughs> that depends on four, three quantities that are our filtered field. This one here, this here. derivative of the field with respect to the field at a position in the autocorrelation of the scale derivative of the field on this three quantity. Studying the large scale limit, we can drop this quantity to just two, that is this one and the okay, only these two quantities. And so so I cannot down. I, I, I cannot break down all the computation that is. There is a lot of algebra, but the idea is that our multiplicity function can be written in terms of just four variable. Our barrier, the scale derivative of the barrier, the autocorrelation of the field at a given scale, and the scale derivative. Of the correlation of the field. Mm. And another interesting, interesting, interesting stuff that we did at this quantity, as you told before, that is not well defined, or better, you have a problem to get the derivative of the, the quantity. In this work, what we did is to find uh, a way to exactly copy this quantity. Because in previous work in cosmology, in uh, large scale cosmology, uh, yeah. The problem it, it was exactly to compute this quantity. It disappeared. Uh, if you want, for example, to compute the bias around uh, uh, the BAO peak uh, or to study the Helmas function uh, in the same form that you know, showed you before. And it is where we show how to properly compute this quantity. It looks divergent if you try to solve directly that integral, but it's not. At the end of the day, it is not. Sorry, what is that quantity? What is delta one two? I don't understand. Sorry. Okay. You need it for a virus of stuff in cosmology, for example, yeah, for the no local bias expansion of the BL peak or yeah, for the Alpha expansion. Oh, that's delta prime squared. Yeah, that ah, square. got it. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's a prime square. <clears throat> and so we reduce our equation to just these four variables. Two of them are, uh, yeah, the, are the barrier quantities, and the other two are the field quantities. Now, the next step was to compute, to find the um, barrier expression that can contain the statistics we are interested in for the Elmas function and uh, the Bosses function. And to do that, the idea is that since the Lagrangian space is a round and Gaussian field, so we can use numerical realization of round and Gaussian field, Gaussian field uh, to find halos and voids exactly uh, yeah, following the definition that we that I did before. And in this way, directly find the effective barrier for them. Now, since uh, a realization of the uh, Gaussian rank of it is the initial, correspond to the initial condition of, of cosmological simulation. We directly use cosmological simulation. In this way, you can also study the evolution of the various paths and so on. And, uh, and we fit over there the barrier. And, um, Sorry, just so I understand. You have the initial conditions, you have some definition of when something's formed a halo at redshift, whatever, and 
and then yeah. but you don't know this b function we don't know the b function we, we just want to find this b function and we do that since all the problem is defined in the organ space with the in the organ space that is actually the initial condition of cosmology classification and so the theoretical definition that we can do before of our objects so that it's a maximum it's not contained in any other maximum and so on we repeat the same measurement on this uh, initial condition to find the distribution of uh, to find the shape of our formation but, traction but the, you're determining that by comparing to the nonlinear calculation or no, comparing to just that we want to study the the, 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 the barrier formation the effect Barrier, the, the, the statistics uh, oh, uh, of the of the peaks of the peaks in the initial space. In the I see. System. Okay. Yeah. And then the map from this peak from the Lagrange to the real space is another step. Okay. Great. So this is the first step. So um, we focus in this case of, on on voids for two reasons. Because first of all, because voids uh, headers and voids uh, can be treated are symmetrical in, uh, in the real space. In the inner space, you can. Here as the same quantity with switch and sign, and also because the theoretical model of voids is not as advanced as the one for heroes in cosmology. And um, yeah, just to draw a plot uh, of uh, what we did with our. This is the devices function that, that um, we, we measure and that we. Theoretically described and uh, and measuring the initial condition. So this is a typical OSS function uh, that behaves exactly as the Thomas function. So we have a, a region where you can describe it as um, a power law plus a truncation. So our model reproduces really well measurements. And if we compare this function with what um, people are still using for voice analysis, uh, so the Sharon van der Weegar multiplicity function, you find something like something like that. So um, um, the standard model for voice statistics that we are using now for analysis doesn't work at all. Um, or better, you can find the best fit uh, for your parameters in the large scale here. But if you want to well describe smaller scale, you really need uh, uh, a new theoretical model, the one here that we propose. And this is pretty important if you want to for the next generation survey. So this is okay if you study a low volume survey, so galaxy survey, but if you want to study Easy, for example, the Euclid, I mean the Euclid collaborations I'm working a lot of that in Euclid and Roman, you really need that. It's our new theoretical model. So now that we found a barrier uh, for voice formation, we also found how this barrier depends on the formation pressure for voice. And uh, we check the, the barrier that we obtain, uh, considering just the multiplicity function for the <coughs> statistics, even beyond the multiplicity function, for example, the void matter, void matter cross correlation function, and using this barrier, so this is the void matter cross correlation function, it is always something like that, where we have here usually this quantity related to the volt radius, and uh, And using the same barrier, we uh, we we was able to we were able to describe to theoretical describe the this quantity the void halo cross the void matter cross correlation function that matches really really very well simulation just the starting from this quantity so that was an important uh, an important result now. Just to skip on the Eulerian mapping, everything here describes the statistics in your linear space. This is the other just space, but we want to describe um, the, the statistics in the real universe, in the real space, in 
we have to map all this quantity from the linear to the nonlinear space. So we studied that as a toy model for now. So we just consider the, um, the spherical map. The idea is that uh, let's just consider as a toy model that our equation evolves spherically in time. And uh, we will see and see what happens with our our uh, uh, statistics, our monophysic function, so our voices function and Helmholtz function. So we start in the initial space and we assume that everything evolves very fast. So this is this is for voids. And so since our uh, voices function our multiplicity function is, is a difference of quantity. Quantity just consider this equation. And uh, what we found is that the map of this quantity from the Lagrangian to the linear space works pretty well up to, let's say, medium scale, something around uh, 30 megaparsec. And then the spherical map. Uh, doesn't work well anymore. This is expected since we know that the tidal field, the matter tidal field um, goes uh, like uh, goes to zero, zero at infinity, so that's great. And, um, and the funny thing is that the standard model using the Richard to, to, to do void analysis it doesn't work at all <laughs> if you use uh, all the full theory the prescription. Well, well, usually people does is to fit in the last case limit, but you cannot describe the small one. And this is particularly capitalized if you consider the theory mapping. And uh, as a last point, let's consider uh, the, same, the same game for halos. So if we consider, we have, this, uh, we have our uh, statistics in, in our space and we want to study halo formation. Now, um, okay, we have the statistics of peaks in the, uh, in the initial space and we want to study if we can use that to study the distribution of collapsed halos in the final, in the vulgar space. And so to do that, we use, we use uh, some approximation. This is just a few model. Uh, we start assuming that uh, mass is conserved from the initial to the final space. It means that all the fluid element uh, in our initial patch will collapse to form one single hill. And uh, another assumption, so we, uh, we assume that all halos share the same void pressure formation. And you know, this is not true. And uh, the last problem for halos is that halos are collapsed object. And now there's the problem to, well, the, to have a precise definition of what collapse means. So the cosmology have different prescriptions to define what collapse means, to which different prescriptions correspond to different halo finer, to which different halo finer correspond to different halo mass function. So this is a great problem. In cosmology, so at the end of the day, if you have a theoretical model for halos, the only way you have is to fit your theoretical model against simulation. <clears throat> so this is what we did. We fit our model against simulation, but mm, we have a barrier, a prior the barrier with a dependence on the Polish pressure. So what we did is to fit our model with the barrier fixed in the density field, the density of the threshold, against halos in the final condition to find what is the linear formation threshold for halos according to our model. And uh, uh, after we did this, so we fit the formation threshold and we find this <coughs> interesting quantity that is uh, roughly 2.4. Your theoretical prediction says something like that. And interestingly, that the, the paper that I mentioned before of, uh, I think that they, where is it? Uh, Robertson et al. that directly studied the distribution in the initial condition, the distribution basically contrasts that will form a void, a, a halo at 
at some point find a value that is really close to that one. Actually, there is a scale dependent quantity because they study that on simulation, we just consider the mean value and it matches. So this is great. We find the same result in our theoretical model that is in agreement with direct measurement for simulation. And we also study the, the, the evolution, the rest of the evolution of both this quantity and uh, the conversion barrier. And uh, interestingly, what we found from redshift, uh, we studied the cases for redshift 2 to the redshift 0. And uh, we found that the formation threshold, both the formation threshold and the barrier, uh, fit that again, using our multiplicity function, are constant. This means that uh, uh, if you properly describe your statistics, uh, Emerging exclusion scientific theory, the Helmholtz function that you get is a, a, a say it, a redshift independent. It means that the only variable that you have, these two quantities are fixed, uh, the formation pressure, the, the formation barrier, and the only quantity that changes is your sigma, this is a standard variable for the Helmholtz function. And so this was our final result. It's pretty interesting that there are, there are many things to do. To go on in this world, that is to better study the map from the Lagrange to the space using different techniques, different methodologies, and also to study higher statistics, such as two point and so on. And so, thank you. So it's this redshift independence that's why why the word universal appears there? Yeah. Redshift yeah. independence. And also because the model is the same for both halos and points. Right. It's depend on, it depends only on the on the um, threshold that you choose, but at the end of the day, we are the same. Can you explain how so this like 1.686 number appears all over this field? Uh, can you explain again like how and maybe intuitively why you get the higher value compared to this. Sure. Um, uh, first of all, that it depends on how you define halos in your health factor. This is the first one. Uh, usually, what uh, you do in a, you have, let's say, three classes of halo, halo finder, the spherical over density halo finder, uh, and of friend based, and uh, say Rockstar, Rockstar is just the one you'll find that, but the idea is that you perform this friend of friend, so you find that um, all the parties are, that are close to each other less than at that length in the sixth dimensional space, in the worst phase space, uh, the, with, with again the definition of the metric there. And so uh, if you start with a spherical Hello finder, the spherical yeah, hello finder. What you usually fix is the mean density contrast of halo, and you fix this quantity around, usually you can choose the number of people, usually it's 2000. And this is because if you study the spherical evolution of the evolution, uh, you, you apply the virial model, the virial theorem to that, and, and, you, and you find that a virialized halo, if the halo collapsed according to the spherical model, it would have a density around that. You can choose a different, yeah, you, you, you convert this quantity to a, an effective length of different particles that you have in the, your friend of friend algorithm, and the same for the rock star. So uh, one reason is that uh, you can relax this, uh, if you want, your theoretical model is the kind of Actually, what colors? If you use this definition, then you have you end up the theoretical linear density contrast that doesn't match the one of your simulation. But this is not the problem of theory, but how you define your problem. I guess. Then this is for the spherical halo finder. 
for the subtractive collapse. If you consider a threshold dependent, then you will end up to a higher threshold at low scale and a lower threshold at higher scale. And so you go closer to this quantity if you allow for an analytical collapse. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the friend of friend. Can you say what sure. it is? Uh, friend of friend of and I'm not talking about Facebook. I'm not talking about Facebook. Sure. Uh, it's an algorithm so that is a way to detect collapsed region in, um, in particles, in, simula in dark matter particle simulation. And they do that, uh, um, let's say, estimating in some way the, dens the local density contrast. And so the idea is that we have a lot of particles. You start with uh, choose one particle, and your friend or friend's particle are all the particles within a given radius. If a particle, uh, and you repeat the same game to all the particles that are within a given distance from the previous one, up to the point that you have no more particles close to each other, closer than uh, this kind of radius. And this is a way to find to find a non-spherical over density object. What kind of uh, non-gravitational interactions, if any, do you assume to have here? And Newtonian gravity. Just gravity? Yeah, just gravity. If you only have gravity, how come they don't just go past each other? Yeah, you have the so-called um, uh, violent relaxation. So you have yeah, since you have a lot of particles to each other that are collapsing, they find a way to, to realize that. They do go past each other. Okay. Yeah, they do they go do. past each other. They, do, they go past each other, and, and then after a while, they settle down into something that looks kind of regular. Except they never really settle down. <laughs> 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 Oh, it's, this isn't, you know, <laughs> fundamental physics. Uh, instead of just talking about friends, let's talk about a stranger. <laughs> Suppose you have a halo, and you have a distant particle from outside the halo just coming in. Would you ever get trapped in the halo, or would you just go through the halo? Yeah, this is a problem of this algorithm. So this is because, this is why people go to the next level of precision to study the full phase space, in this way you can uh, also consider the velocity of the particle to decide if this is within or how large your phase is. So what if Rockstar is does is it also makes sure that they're near each other in velocity space. So if something comes in with 10,000 kilometers per second to a halo that's 1,000 kilometers per second, you know, gravitational potential well, then it will just go through. And friends of friends, as it's going through, will add it to the halo. But Rockstar is just a different algorithm which would exclude those high velocity things or different velocity things. But it is, but it is the fact, the case that halos are defined by algorithms, not really by fundamental physics quantities. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a real problem. <laughs> At the end of the day, you, you see yeah. galaxy and halos. And, and I consider it a limitation of contemporary cosmology that we do depend on. A, yeah. When we do these things, we depend on some. It'd be easier if we could just Algorithm. image the dark matter. Exactly. <laughs> we wouldn't... Yeah. We should just talk about the <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Okay. Even if you start with uh, a low velocity particle from the outside coming in, wouldn't it just accelerate and gain a high velocity by the time it gets to the halo? Uh, yeah, and but, it, but it's a multi-particle system, so there will be a redistribution of energy, and it will, in general, get captured. It, you can think of it like, if, I mean, a lot of people describe it as dynamical friction. But yeah, yeah that multi-body systems happen. do capture particles, okay. so they do grow. The bound, the bound set of particles grows. <clears throat> But it is fundamentally, you're right, it's a conservative system. Like your intuition that it's conservative is true, but because it's multi-body, it effectively is not conservative. That's what I learned as a freshman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah, the friction is like a particle comes through 
and its ordered motion is converted into disordered motions of the things it's going by. So it's friction. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is almost okay. the definition okay. of friction. Yeah. It's not so much well, sense. <laughs> Look, Chandra said it, not me. <laughs> but but Chandra Sekar's explanation was wrong. That you can explain to us next year. But we should, <laughs> we should thank Giovanni again. <laughs> and I have some emergency at home that I have to deal with. And there should be cookies out there. Thank <laughs> you.